Hey everybody, I'm really excited about today's episode. I talked with my new internet friend, Kirsten Anderson, and we had a really insightful and dare I say fun conversation about building playful possibilities to make work more human. Kirsten explains why play and productivity are not at odds with one another. She shares how the lessons from the love and success of her toy store days inspired her to help more adults play and how Lego serious play can unlock some sticky challenges in the world of work. I continue to be in awe of the learning and joy I'm finding personally in learning from my Building Thinkers guests, and I hope you are too. Without any further ado, here's my conversation with Kirsten Anderson. All right, welcome to the Building Thinkers podcast. Today, I'm joined by Kirsten Anderson, and I'm so excited. We're going to talk about all things playfulness, and she's already dancing in her seat, so I'm so excited. I think it's going to be so much fun. We're going to talk about the benefits of playfulness. I'm extra excited because in our nerdy note-taking document, I see three research uh, proposals or research uh, sections linked. That always makes me really excited, so we'll dig into those and learn more about her company, Integrated Play. And so thank you so much, Kirsten, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Happy to play here. Yay. Okay, we like to start off with a little bit of where uh, did we get connected? How did we become new internet friends? So anything about that? Yeah, well, (laughs) we got connected through someone that I met through TikTok, actually, and then Instagram, and then we started chatting, uh, Kara Kirby, who you interviewed. And uh, I recently listened to your interview and I noticed that there was some rascal talk on there. And I'm like, these two are playful people. I mean, I knew that about Kara Kirby already, that she was playful after we interviewed her uh, for in the Culture First community, uh, Vancouver chapter. We had her as a guest. And so, yeah, I I love that about you, that you self-identified as a rascal. (laughs) Oh, yes. Well, she gave me that label, so I didn't know. I didn't know that that's where I was. But um, then (laughs) once I got more of a definition, then it did resonate. And I also think it's a growing piece, perhaps, of my identity because I was a very much rule follower uh, Mm -hmm. at first. And then as I pushed against some of the status quo, realized that wasn't going to always serve me. (laughs) And sometimes I needed to ask for uh, forgiveness instead of permission. And that's where a lot of growth has occurred in my own personal life. And and then this idea, I'm so excited to dig into play too, because some of my background is in early childhood. And when people ask me a summary of, I uh, have a master's in, in that background. And if people ask me about the summary, I'm like, in one sentence, kids learn through play and really adults do too. <laughs> yeah. And I love that you're, that you're both pushing against the status quo, because I mean, that's what a, a playful mindset can really help us do, you know, and, and we need new, right? We need innovation. We need to be looking at things and reimagining things. And if there's nothing new, I think it, well, from your background, you'll know, uh, Jean Piaget said, uh, play is how anything new comes about. Mm, I love that. Play is how anything new comes about. Yeah. If we're just doing things as they've always been done, if we're just coloring inside the lines and following the frameworks that were there before, then that's what we'll end up with. And so when those frameworks are no longer serving us or no longer working for what we need, we we have to think about where we're starting from. That's so exciting. So one of the places I like to start is if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit of your story in particular, I'd love to hear, you know, what you're currently building, what is currently, you know, making you feel excited and a little bit of your background. So tell us about where you came from and how you got into what you're doing now. Well, I do sometimes say that I kind of have the DNA of play in my genes. Um, my mom had a preschool when I was a kid, like in the house, a very successful preschool. And so I used to help her out in the preschool. And then she went into advertising. And then one day she decided to uh, have this toy store. And so she dragged me out of the movie theater management to come manage her toy store. And so we would travel the world searching for the best toys, you know, European toys, not what you would find in the big box stores. And, and that was really fun for like 10 years. And then she's like, okay, what are you going to do now? Cause she, you know, I, I'm going to have to sell this store to retire. So what are you going to do? So I ended up getting certified as a coach, uh, back in 2000, you know, it was just kind of the industry was just beginning, but my heart was still with toys, found a great location, very European little new village and opened up this toy store and I had everyone wear white lab coats. I called them toyologists. We had prescription pads 
and we would hand out uh, prescriptions for play. We would listen, you know, to all the symptoms, all the challenges that parents or aunts or uncles or grandparents were having, like, you know, what is this child like? Really listen. And then we would prescribe, you know, what was perfect for them uh, rather and really differentiating ourselves from, um, you know, what you would see as, oh, what's the latest fad or trend. And so we ended up being on the news, like, you know, within a month of being open national news. And that subsequently led to uh, a monthly spot on TV. So I was I was the toyologist, uh, pres- you know, prescribing play for the province. And so it was voted best toy store in Canada and I thought after 15 years and I thought okay I've reached my peak here it's gonna open up another store or what else you know what what else am I capable of and I kept being asked to speak I really enjoyed the the speaking opportunities and I thought well you know what I could try and sell the store let's see and it sold within six weeks so no time to reinvent (laughs) and I ended up um yeah, opening this business in a great place solutions, not really knowing what I was going to be doing in it, except maybe speaking on the power of play, because mm-hmm. I had been really motivated uh, seeing how children were playing less and less in the industry, we could call it mm-hmm. compression. Um, younger and younger, they would stop playing with toys. And I thought, well, what mm-hmm. if we got middle schoolers to play more? And that would make the elementary school kids realize it's still cool to play. And then, it, well, middle schoolers aren't going to play if they see the high schoolers aren't playing. So we need high schoolers to play more. Well, how are we going to get high schoolers to play more? We need adults to play more. Uh, so they can show it every day at home, at work. And, uh, of course, there's lots of barriers that are keeping adults from playing. But then that really became my mission was to get adults playing more, especially at work. And so through that, I ended up getting certified in Lego Serious Play. Uh, so working with corporate teams on uh, on their messiest challenges using Lego. And that was 80% of my business pre-pandemic. So that, you know, gets you to March 12th of uh, 2020. <laughs> wow. And then the okay. drama really started. <laughs> okay, I want to hear about so many things. Okay, i got to think about where I want to go first. Um, I'll leave you on that cliffhanger. <laughs> Okay, well, I want to come back to that, though, too. I love hearing, you know, as an entrepreneur, like how people navigated that part. Um, One thing I'm interested in, first of all, I can't get this out of my head. You need to be connected with Scott Bedley. He um, is a friend through EdTech Circles, and he's amazing. And he's an educator um, who started an initiative called Global Play Day um, for schools. Yeah, I I did the first one. Oh, you did? Okay, so... February, it was February 4th, which is my birthday, actually. So I was like, this was meant to be that the first global school play day was on February 4th, my birthday. (laughs) That is serendipitous. Okay, I want to go back to the toy store for a moment. And I want to go back (laughs) to this idea that came to you of the lab coats and the prescriptions and this listening. I have never heard anything like that. So remarkable that it's not just a store that you come in and again, the fads and all of that, but that you listen to a customer. It's almost like a consulting experience in a store. And so are there any takeaways from that? I just think that that's so unique. And is that a similar practice to what you bring forward to integrated play in that kind of consulting and training work? I'm just making maybe a connection there. I think there is a connection and, um, So the skills as a coach um, that I learned about asking deeper questions, open-ended questions, active listening, mirroring back what you hear, all of that helped in my training of my toyologist, of course. And, you know, people become so used to not having service. And I really wanted to, you know, we were 750 square feet or something. Like we were packed in. But our dollars per square foot in that store were, you know, stratospheric. Um, We were almost doing a million dollars out of that tiny little space and a year. (laughs) So the the reason why it was so successful was was because of that that link to to listening. And I think now, you know, when we have discovery calls with clients, whether it's a coaching client, a consulting client, around training, around doing a keynote, it's is listening to like what are those pain points you know what are the challenges you know how you know it's not like oh you just have to pick off a menu this is what we offer Mm -hmm. you know we can custom be you know do a bespoke training or facilitation or keynote or or talking one-on-one or team coaching all those things 
are very affected by how well we listen for sure. Oh, I love that. Um, one of the things that uh, I'm thinking about too is we ask this question often, what do people overcomplicate? So in this case, what do people overcomplicate about play? Or I also like the synthesis system, if only people knew. So when it comes to playing, you're thinking about the type of work that you're doing, what would you say to people, you know, if only people knew? And it can be any of the different, you know, end users, you know, it, entrepreneurs or leaders in the work that you're doing, if only people knew. Yeah, I, I think what that question brings to mind for me is uh, being in a room full of CEOs and we were doing a little workshop for them and we asked them what their barriers to play were. Mm. And, uh, and you may already guess, I think for a lot of people, it's obvious that their barriers to play you know, they listed maybe, you know, well over a dozen barriers, but they all could be come down to one word and that is fear. Mm. It was all fear based, you know, fear of judgment was, was the biggest one. And, and that judgment of many different people, fear of judgment by, uh, their peers, by their competitors, by their colleagues, by their employees, their frontline employees, um, by their family. And so I think, if people only knew that play really is the antidote to, to fear, that once they're playful with those people, even their competitors, I bet, uh, or with their colleagues or with those, you know, all different levels, it really is an equalizer. And so people, you know, you lose that status and that... Um, that hierarchy that can really keep people separated and you gain a little bit of vulnerability and you get to share more ideas with each other. More people are heard when you're playful with each other, with whether it's in a board meeting or a retreat or it doesn't have to be contained to a, a team building session. It can be you're both working on a co-working on an Excel document. You can still be <laughs> playful. And so I think if people only knew playfulness was so powerful to the bottom line that's kind of my catch line the bottom line benefits of playfulness at work and it doesn't have to be play it can be playfulness it's making me think about when you get to some of those roots of the fear like can be for all these variety of reasons just thinking about this the power of as you said the antidote to fear and I'm thinking, actually, Kara and I were talking a lot about how fear comes around this sense of loss. Like when people are going through change in organizations, there's yeah. a sense of loss and it goes back to this, this fear. And I'm thinking about also all of the connected challenges that come up for people because they're fearful. So for example, somebody may not communicate at their prime because they're afraid that what they're saying, you know, there's some sort of consequence to what they're saying. And so they might become, come off as passive aggressive or not speak up in a meeting or, you know, these different things. And then that causes all sorts of other challenges of humans interacting together. And it's, if we could do a thought experiment for a moment and imagine people lose that fear that we, that we put that fear in a box for a moment and they don't have it imagining the ability for people to innovate, the ability for people to communicate, the, the ability for people to be authentic and vulnerable and alive at work because yeah. they've been able to wrestle with that fear or, you know, it's just making me think about those possibilities. Have you seen, maybe my question here is, what are some of those bottom line benefits you see to when there is that spirit of play and, and maybe some of that fear is addressed and there's that antidote there. What do you see happen in cultures or in experiences that you've had? Well, to address what you said about putting the fear in the, in the box, you know, I, I would say, you know, that's an open box. It's not like a closed, locked box. It's, you oh, know, okay. you I can't know hide it you away. have fear, right? <laughs> you know you got it. it. It's not going anywhere. And there's a really old book called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. And I always say, or I, I often say, feel the fear and play anyway. It's okay to have fear. Just keep playing through that fear, right? You know, like, it's okay for us to feel uncomfortable discomfort. That's where the growth is. 
And so to, to your point about or question around um, bottom line benefits, you reference communication. So imagine if, you know, an entire organization's what had their communication amplified, up leveled, you know, we were communicating more effectively, more efficiently, uh, more vulnerably, more honestly, uh, because of playfulness. And then that, of course, links to collaboration. So, you know, now we're c communicating better. So now we can collaborate better and we can share ideas more effectively. And before those two things, we have to work on psychological safety. You know, how are people feeling together? I got certified in psychological safety during the pandemic and it's been very popular. And, you know, I'm not coming at it from, you know, an academic standpoint and, you know, stage from the stage. It's like, no, we're going to play with this. You know, how do we wear different hats and talk to each other from different perspectives? And, you know, we use some applied improv techniques there. So psychological safety, you know, there, there's so many examples of big, big organizations that had tragic tragic events happen because of not having psychological safety. I won't name companies here, but yeah. we talked about it in my course, like, you know, billion dollar companies that had really, really dire consequences uh, because engineers didn't have psychological safety to, to speak up and say like, this is wrong. Like this machine is going to fail. And so we, we definitely need that. And there's ways uh, t to create playfulness within that environment as well. Sales, mm. you know, like we talked about the sales within the um, toy store. Well, a lot of that, you know, those listening activities can be learned, like learning and development. It can help your learning and development. It can help you retain information. It can um, help you in your sales conversations around, especially around failure, like for, for salespeople, being able to be rejected, to mm. um, deal with objections, super important for business development. So that's an, another area. And then during the pandemic, uh, change, resilience, stress, burnout, mm. creating that term, that turmoil and that turnover that's super expensive for companies, adding that playfulness and, and all the different activities that you can bring into your um, community, especially with distributed teams, we, we really, really need to focus on stress and change and burnout and well-being of, of our employees. Do you really want to you know, keep hiring, keep hiring, keep hiring? What if playfulness helped that aspect of your business as well? So yeah. I, I could go on, but I think that no, kind of covers I, I, I love it. <laughs> no, absolutely. I, one of the things that came to mind is like, why? So you were talking about the keep hiring, the keep hiring. And, and, and of course, I think you and I see the, the benefits here um, of playfulness. Why? And you just talked a lot about a lot of the barriers. But what is it perhaps in leaders or company mindsets that doesn't have them already making that connection? Like, why do they need someone to come in and help right. them? Like, can they just read a book? Or why do they need that support? Right. Great question. Well, I mean, maybe they need a chief play officer. You know, every company maybe needs a chief play officer or a chief happiness officer. That I, I, I know love it. Okay, existing. future. Now I have a new future career vision map. That would be so yeah, fun. Goal. Chief play <laughs> officer. I want to do that. Right. Yeah, I'd love to do that. And I know there are chief happiness officers out there doing doing some of this work. Uh, Claude Silver is a chief heart officer, you know, doing, you know, similar work that I'm, I'm sure has some playfulness uh, as a baseline there. Why aren't some organizations prioritizing these things uh, so that, and I do, you know, sometimes I, I'm in that world of companies that do have great cultures and, right. you know, really focus on those companies that are doing it right. And I know that there's, there's lots that aren't. When we talked about fear, one of the things that people are looking at is the, that fear of judgment of not being productive. So it's mm. the whole definition of play. We come down to, you know, we haven't talked about like, what is play? Um, and people, ha and there's as many definitions of play as there is definitions of love. You know, how we use love and, oh, I love this sandwich. I, I love using, um, you know, this platform. <laughs> you know, I love my spouse. I love my child, my dog. So play has very different um, connotations depending on who's doing it and where it's being done. May yeah, I ask you what's ball. your definition of play? Yeah, I really like to associate play with flow. 
especially when we're looking in a work context, uh, you know, like working on an Excel spreadsheet for me can be can be flow, can feel playful sometimes. Uh, it, it depends. Work, working with people, that connection piece, it can feel very playful, that levity, that lightness, mm. and not bringing a super serious attitude to it. On the other hand, some people, like you're working on a puzzle, uh, or, or you're, and a puzzle could be a, a problem. And so mm. you, whether you, it's a jigsaw puzzle or an engineering problem, if if you are engrossed in that and, and it's a solitary activity, that could be play for you as well. And you lose track of time, you know, time, you know, expands. You're like, oh, I forgot to eat lunch. Mm-hmm. I think like losing track of time and, and just being in the moment and being present, all of those things are playful to me. And it can look very, very different. Active play, imaginative play, more intellectual play, lots of different ways for us to play. But I think when people think of play as the opposite of work is when Mm. we run into a challenge and play is not frivolous. We are hardwired for play. We need play. Mm. There are lots of studies that show how, um, I think it was Google that did a study during the pandemic where people were having back to back meetings and they were not Mm. taking breaks. Yes. And then they did a, a, then they put an ERG machine on or EEG machine and they studied their yeah. brains when they took these little five minute breaks and their yes. brains like totally lit up from, you know, just having five minutes to do something calming or meditative. That's an actual play break, like scheduling it, being intentional about how, about your day so that you can be more productive as well. Because I think there's a lot of play we can have in work. Yes. When you were talking about the opposite of work and like where that gets us into trouble and also this idea of productivity, we're obsessed with productivity and, and businesses should be, you know, it's that that's directly connected to the bottom line. But what's interesting to me, and this happens a lot in, I work in the social impact spaces, so education, technology, and then what I classify as human flourishing. So anybody that's helping humans flourish, like I end up in those spaces to kind of disconnect sometimes between the Uh, emerging research and practice that happens. It happens in all sorts of industries. But I think that in this concept, right, of productivity, if let's say insert manager that doesn't yet kind of get this and is like, we have to be productive, we have to make progress. But then there's research showing us it's actually to our benefit and to the bottom line and to productivity and to human flourishing, which equals business flourishing, that we are wired for this. And so if you are managing the humans and you want them to live better and work better, this is not just a nice to have, not just a frivolous, um, not child's play. Like the, the, the child's play is actually learning and growth and potential. So I think it's really interesting when you get down to the heart of it, why somehow that message gets conflated or confused. Um, what do you like to pull forward in your bag of research that underlies how you support teams um, that makes this point again, that it's not frivolous? Yeah. Did I ask um, a question in there? I'm not sure if I did. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, no, I can, I can play with that. <laughs> What am I, that should be like, that should be like on my tombstone. I can play with that or plays well with others. <laughs> play oh, around the research brought, concepts. Right. Yeah. You brought up the word flourishing. And I just want to say, because we talked about chief play officer and chief happiness officer, uh, that is another role I will put my hand up for as chief flourishing officer. Ooh, like um, so that's kind of like the, a dream job title that I've also been uh playing with it yeah so research uh one piece that recently i was spoke at a change conference and a piece of research that has stuck in the mind of of somebody that was um he's really been thinking about the workshop that we did and and mulling it over and he said i keep thinking back to that research you talked about which was the batman effect and the batman effect uh, which you probably already know where they asked the kids not to play with an ipad and they were given either a batman outfit or a dora costume and uh, of course they lasted much longer with the persona putting on the persona of batman or dora because they were stronger and they were more resilient and and so i i talk about how that imagination play how you know putting on a different role can help us in lots of different ways as we look at 
change as we look at all the different roles it can help us with empathy of you know being in a different role in the organization like if i was in this role you know how would i feel looking at this challenge so you know it'd be easy for a professional not to see that as playful you know but that is basically what we used to do as kids you know we would put on all these different roles and, and tr- all these different hats and try them on uh even the de bono six thinking hats uh, you know, there's ways to make that super playful where, you know, if I'm working in person, I actually bring physical hats for us to try on. If I'm working virtually, we put on filters, you know, all the different colors or different colored backgrounds. So you can have the different uh, colored thinking hats as you approach a, a creative problem solving. So, yeah, that's like one small piece of research uh, around personas. And, you know, there's other there's other research around that as well of, you know, even Amy Cuddy, you know, about you know, putting your hands on your hips, you know, like a Wonder Woman pose and how that can impact your confidence and how you approach. And um, so, yeah, that's... It's making me think about my five-year-old who I was traveling for work for a couple days and I was coming back and reconnecting with him. He was doing some kind of odd behaviors and he started pretending to be a, a dog. And so I was like, oh, what did, I just went with it, of course, and was like, well, what does the puppy need right now? And instantly he was coming up to me and snuggling and wanted to be pet and but wasn't able to quite access that as son to mom, but needed to be puppy to owner. And I thought this is a representation of that same concept. He was able to access um, more easily in that persona, um, is a dog still a persona? I guess. Anyway, um, Mm -hmm. of what he needed. And I was able to also more directly, I feel like ask kind of like, Oh, what does puppy need? You know? Um, so I think that was a moment that stood out to me. And then I also was thinking my, I think we can transition to Legos with this, this comment here. My boys just love Legos and, um, I, depending on what's going on in my mind, at that time in work and in my brain and everything, sometimes have trouble accessing my own desire to play with them or my my um, kind of fun playfulness when I'm wrestling with something in my mind. So I have to be very intentional because I know the importance of, of me being there, playing with them and letting them lead and all of that. Um, sometimes that is an intentional transition I have to do. But what I was thinking about was how both my boys, five and eight right now, build these beautiful worlds with their Legos. And they first like to make whatever the actual instructions say, but then those go out the window and they go in the big tub. And then they build all these beautiful things. And last night they were making an ice cream shop and the dinosaur was coming to the ice cream shop. And then my character got in the vehicle and went with them. Anyway, what I'm thinking about all of this is, um, can you share with us a little bit about how you use the Lego play? What is it specifically called? Lego serious play. Lego serious play. Can you tell us a little bit about how that, no pun intended, plays out in (laughs) the environments that you're in? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. When I discovered Lego serious play, only a few months into, I think I'd just come back from Denmark. My first paid keynote was in Denmark. Unfortunately, Lego, uh, the Lego land was not open when I came through. Um, It was opening the following weekend, but... I discovered Lego Series Play and I went, it was like light shining down. Oh, it was like, this is perfect. This is like play meets serious challenges for work. Like the, you know, the biggest banks were using it, insurance companies, you know, entertainment companies at high levels had used Lego Series Play. And Lego actually, uh, you know, based on constructivism, you know, which is a, a part of education um, thought when they were really struggling, like believe it or not, they're one of the uh, most successful companies in the world right now, but they were struggling um, about 25 years ago. And they thought, you know, we have all these tools, you know, maybe something can be done with this. And so like three professors got together and they worked out this system where they take the everyone gets the same set of lego in front of them and they're asked to build in a short period of time the answer to a powerful question so this is where my coaching comes in handy to create these powerful questions based on the powerful discovery call where i was listening 
And, and then, you know, it could be around creativity and innovation. It could be around process. It could be around strategy. It could be around culture change. It could be around sales. It, it could be any, any topic. So I don't have to come in as an expert in the room. All I have to do is ask the questions. You know, we've done this for 1,300 people at a huge conference where they just had like little ducks. Um, so not the same like whole Lego set. But we normally, it, it could, it's like maybe 15 people, 10 people in a boardroom or at a retreat. Um, sometimes it's a, a little part of a keynote, you know, we'll just do a little sample. But usually it's like a half day session. So, we're, so we get time at, at least a half day session we have time to like figure out like what's going on and then what could happen what's possible what are the obstacles on the way and then how do these all interchange and how do we you know hook these lego sets up together uh, and map it out you know customer journey mapping or business model canvas we can do we can do design thinking with it mm. and so it the beautiful part of it that you described from your boys building Lego that happens in this setting is you, you build a model and as you, everyone gets equal time at the table. And that's a beautiful part of it. The inclusiveness, mm. everyone's on the same level. Everyone gets the same amount of time. So you're not having 20% of the people at the table doing 80% of the talking, which so mm. often happens. We've all been in those meetings. And, and you get one to two minutes to describe what you've built. And as you're describing it, like your subconscious mind is like, oh yeah, and this red brick can mean this. And this flower that I put here, oh yeah, that could actually mean like the rewards the you know, at the end. And, and when you put it there, you didn't really think of it. But as you, your story comes out, your subconscious adds more and more meaning to the little bricks. And you're not going for realism. You're just going for, you know, assigning meaning, meaning to each brick, whether you know, a red brick can mean your boss, a red brick can mean an obstacle, it can be anything, right? So it's a, it's a great process. And it was very, very, very much a, a part of my, the majority of my business pre pandemic, for sure. That sounds incredible. Yeah. Now I want like 18,000 different career pathways. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll just I have to do find that too. To play together. I'm I want to play that. Okay. I want to ask, this is maybe a nerdy question. So when you're talking about what is happening in the subconscious coming yeah. forward when they're doing that work, is that the same principle that is in play therapy when, when a play therapist is working with a child and they're doing the sand trays and they start talking about the, the policeman that came and, and, and a play therapist understands what that's representative of. Is that the same psychological principles that are happening? I've never studied play therapy, but it was a path I considered when I um, was working for my mom because we would have so many play therapists come and shop in the store for Playmobil, uh, primarily for Playmobil, if you're familiar with the mm -hmm. German uh, brand. They're amazing um, and, and a huge part of uh, sand trade play for play therapists. N side note, there is actually um, a growing movement for play therapy for adults, uh, which is very tempting to me to like, again, switch careers yeah, yeah, yeah. and go down that road. Um, that and event planning, like, and it's so funny, you oh. know, because I feel like the career I've created for myself has these elements of play therapy mm -hmm. and elements of event planning in it. Uh, you know, like if I'm doing a retreat, you know, like, or, or any kind of big workshop design, it's a, a bit like planning an event. And, um, so I can't speak to the psychology of, uh, right, of right. play therapy, uh, but I would say that from, from what I know, from, from what I've seen or read, uh, you know, there's a lot of metaphors happening. Mm -hmm. And so it is about mm -hmm. reading those metaphors. The, the thing is, is that with Lego Serious Play, we, as we describe what we've built, are describing our own metaphors as, a, as mm -hmm. adults, like, oh, this can mean this, this can mean that. And, and so there is that self-discovery, self-awareness, uh, those aha moments uh, that, you know, I, I get so excited when it's a room of a hundred people and like, I had an epiphany when, uh, oh. and you know, I like, we've only worked together for such a short time and that's, you know, those, right. those are the big rewards that I get uh, working with so people when they. Then that is making me think that maybe the mirroring here is, or the reflection that I'm seeing is the, that coaching where you don't necessarily have to translate what it is that they have built. They are yeah. self-aware and right. they are translate. So you 
don't need like okay red brick equals right. you know this exactly this is not <laughs> okay. like and this kind of leads to dream interpretation because when i was a teenager i took night school classes with adults a lot of them and one of the courses i took was dream interpretation and uh dream my dad's a psychologist my mom the toy business person right so i may have blended my parents sense. as well <laughs> it all makes sense right and so he would always listen to my dreams he would write down my dreams as a kid so i was very interested in dreams i, I remembered lots of them and what i really learned in this vivid dreaming class was that uh meanings of things like a black cat if you dream about a black cat and i dream about a black cat they can mean completely different things because it's our association with that object. It's how we would describe it. And so it's the same with a Lego object. If I'm describing this elephant, it may have a completely different meaning than the elephant would mean to you. And so it is very important that we as participants, as listeners, ask questions of the builder, but we don't um, say, you know, we don't imply our own meaning on on their build and this builds safety right because then yes. people don't feel like they're going to get attacked they're not going to get mm. judged people are only asking questions they're not saying oh well why did you build it that way or you know what about this you know like and so it, it is a very safe environment as well to to build and and even just bringing us back to play lego's very familiar to a, a mm. lot of people and whether you played with it as a kid or not like i didn't have a lot of lego as a kid but it's very intuitive. There's not really a wrong way to do it. And if you have never even seen them before, you can like start to do something with it. Yeah. The other thing exactly. that that's making me think about back to the subconscious is perhaps there's something that overlaps with the same thing of when you get an idea when you're like in the shower or when you get an yeah. idea when you're walking or moving your body yeah. or playing, right? Is that you yeah. are unlocking this potential so for those non-believers yet out there of the power of play, like recognizing what your brain is capable of doing in those moments where um, we were not putting fear in the box, but we are dancing with that fear and allowing yeah. it. Seth Godin talks about that. Yeah, we we go for it, right? We, we put the flower there and we build the house and or whatever it might be. And then we have the space to kind of look at what we've built and it's outside of our head. It's making me also think of the concept of the extended mind, like yeah. that, that yeah. we can't like hold it all in here, right? And so maybe yeah. that becomes a representation of what we were thinking about and processing and gives us space again, that we can't kind of work out all that complexity up here. Yeah, and I, I think that that distance, like what yeah. what was happening with you with you know playing the dog and play, you know playing with the Lego mm -hmm. with your child, is the same with the Lego in a in a in professional setting. You know, it gives some distance. So again, we have some safety. We're not writing it, and, and you can write afterwards after you do the Lego. You can write some of those ideas on a post-it note and put it up on the wall. That's great. But if we just work with post-it notes, and I'm a huge fan of post-it notes. If you were to see my wall, it's like covered like seven feet of post-it yeah. notes behind me. I'm a big fan and we use them. But if if people think that just post-it notes are playful, mm -hmm. I mean, it's maybe the start of playfulness, but it is, we can go so much bigger than just post-it notes because it's a completely different way of thinking. And I, I think how you're describing um how we come up with ideas and, and when I do creativity workshops we talk about those top three ways that people come up with ideas in the car walking in the shower we're alone we're relaxed mm -hmm. and so I play nice music and it's quiet while you're building and you're not talking to the person beside you while you're building and so yeah those are opportunities and going back to what you were talking about productivity like what mm -hmm. if we built that into our days as well like oh I'm gonna do five minutes with my lego uh, or I'm going to do five minutes mm -hmm. of dancing, you know, I bet the ideas would come a lot freer flowing than if we were just kept staring at a blank screen trying to write a document or, you know, solve a problem. Just step away from it for a minute. <laughs> when you're thinking of content that you're developing, workshops that you're working on with people, what's kind of the process that you use to come together with those those ideas to to pull it into a deliverable session for a client it sounds like you do a lot of yep. bespoke training and that's yep. kind of similar to what i've been involved with what's it look like for you i think that kind of leads into the question like from our earlier cliffhanger of what happened when the pandemic oh. hit march 12th <laughs> do that don't so, leave the people hanging 
Yeah, March 12th, 2020, I was delivering a workshop for electronic arts for 75 people. And we were doing Lego Series Play, shared Lego, and all of a sudden, you know, five o'clock, they get the call, we're closing studios internationally. <laughs> like, as of tomorrow morning, don't come into the office. Turns out there's a pandemic coming, we'll see you in a couple weeks. So uh, I was supposed to be doing another session with the other 75 people from the team uh, the following Thursday. And they're like, we'll have to postpone, you know, you know, till the end of April or something when we're back. And yeah. needless to say, you know, the end of that story was there was no going back to the office. And so we ended up switching to uh, a virtual model, which was exciting because we got to have people from Florida and Romania join us on these virtual calls about what were you know, what was challenging and mm -hmm. we couldn't do Lego serious play. And what I ended up using were uh, playful activities. And so when I'm designing a program, what I do a lot of is um, working in the applied improv space. So using the ideas, the principles of improv, I'm not a performer, never been on stage doing improv, <laughs> but there is a lot of principles of improv that are applicable to business, to communication, mm -hmm. to how we support each other. And mm -hmm. so I bring in these activities and they can be done virtually or in person. And, uh, and so how I design the sessions is creating opportunities, um, making sure that there is an energy flow, like we have connection mm -hmm. before content, yes. um, that we have... Mm -hmm. Um, a flow where it's an activity, maybe a little bit of talking about something or the research behind something, some reflection, and then activity, and it kind of goes in this little flow, uh, an arc, if you were, and you know, try keeping the energy up and engaging. And I'm not standing there just talking at them. I want it mm -hmm. to be a facilitated session where they're learning from all the wisdom that's in the room, which whether you're doing Lego or you're doing applied improv or combining things, uh, I think that's the exciting part that, because then you get to work with anybody in any industry in any role because, because yes. you know, people know, uh, just like in coaching, like the answers are there. It's just right. about pulling it out. Ah, oh, I love that. I have a, a tagline for my work that talks about unleashing human potential through learning yeah. experiences that are full of joy and rooted in research. And I think a lot about that, that human potential, um, I saw in, in one of your references to Sir Ken Robinson. I think some of the rooting concepts from, I remember seeing the, where they had taken his work and made a version of it with the dry erase marker, those dry erase marker videos. I remember seeing that whenever mm -hmm. that came out. And then I actually got to meet him through an amazing opportunity <sighs> Um, oh. and, and spend a dinner with him and about 15 other people. Um, and amazing. he's, he was everything that you would imagine. He really pushed my thinking around, of course, what's possible in education. What, what is the heart of education? And in particular, this idea of the human potential in our students. And then I translate that now to when I do adult learning and the untapped potential um, sometimes that our systems put in place or, or some of that environment of fear and, and even like toxic environments for people where they could be flourishing. And so anyway, uh, uh, that made me connect back with that concept. And, and the I power think, there. you know, when we look at those systems, looking at why they were created, whether it's in education or adult learning, like in the corporate setting or in schools, and I really particularly care about the young, I care about all of them, but the young kids and, and why have they been created that way to, to what end, to what purpose. And I think, you know, the Puritan work ethic, the capitalism of creating cogs in a wheel does not serve our future. It doesn't serve the future of work. It doesn't serve the fact that we need a lot of people that are create the future skills that we need are slowly being integrated into like emotional intelligence you know they are adding that to some curriculums but not all curriculums right. and so it's like s real sprinkled in right now real sprinkled in 
Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. There's still so much work to do. There's no shortage there's so of much work. work to do. I'm so glad there's so much work still to do because then we can play and discover and figure out, you know, what's needed next. Oh, Kirsten, it's been so enjoyable connecting on all of this. I would love if you would share any book recommendations, podcast recommendations, and then I'd love to hear a little bit more about your company, all of that. So wherever you want to start on that. Yeah. Uh, well, the book recommendations, I was so proud of myself. I read 30 books this year. So that was like the most I've read in one year. <laughs> I really challenged myself. So there's a million different books I could recommend. There's a great time management book I read last year called uh, 4,000 Weeks um, Time Management for Mortals by Oliver Berk Berkman. That was excellent. But if you want to read about play, um, probably the most well-known book that's been out for quite a while is Dr. Stuart Brown's A Play. And then my dear friend who I co-collaborate play, Paul Gary, where he came out with a book called Playful Rebellion this year. So I give you that link. And then another friend of mine, Michael Rucker, he's being published in January. So his book comes out uh, soon and his is called The Fun Habit. So I kind of put in some some basics there rather than like yes. all the business books that I mean, yes. I, I've looked at some of your previous guests and they have listed wonderful books that I've enjoyed, too. So. I didn't go down the path of recommending um, traditional business books, but if you want to dive into more play, that's wonderful. Oh, I love that. Thank you. And then you wanted to know about podcasts? Yes. Hidden Brain is a great podcast. Again, there's so many different ones, but there's also, I can't speak to the rest of the Huberman Lab podcast uh, quality, but there's one particular episode on play about improving your brain, rewiring your brain from the Huberman lab. So that's worth listening to. And as you said, I did list the, there's so many good Ted talks and there are some on play as well. Actually, Gary did a talk on play TEDx. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, there's the link to Sir Kenneth Robinson's and learning courses you wanted to know about. Sure. Yes. But <laughs> my, my friend Jenny Lamb and she has a, a course again around time. As someone who may be ADD, uh, time is uh, a bit of a challenge for me. And she has a great program coming out in January called 11 Minutes to Mars. Uh, where, yeah. And so, you know what? I'll send you her information. Uh, she'd be a great person to talk to. She is fabulous. So, yeah. And of course, we're, of course we're accepting new clients. Uh, we are definitely playing all over the world. And uh, I am in Vancouver, Canada. But it's... Uh, I'm portable. I, I have Lego will travel. <laughs> it fits in a suitcase. <laughs> oh my goodness. I love it. Okay. So we'll link your LinkedIn and then, um, your company website. And so if anyone wants to reach out about any of the work that you do, they can find you there. Wonderful. Yeah, I like to play on Instagram, sometimes even TikTok. LinkedIn is the most serious, but I am a little bit playful on LinkedIn too. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Kirsten, again, thank you so much for your time and just for digging in and this opportunity to play together. And I'm excited to continue to stay connected and watch the amazing work that you do. Maybe play together in person sometime in our future. That would be fun. That would be awesome. Thanks so much for listening to the Building Thinkers podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and share with your friends. And if you enjoyed what you heard, please leave a podcast rating and review. That helps more listeners find us in the world of podcasting algorithms. You can find out more about my learning and development strategy services at buildingthinkers.com. And remember, there's no limit to what you can learn.